Um, so welcome, good big crowd. So um, my name is Vitaly Ganosov. I'm uh, an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology, and I'm uh, very happy to have lots of people. We have all these great panelists that will tell us um, um, something a little bit about this particular program at the NSF, which is called Graduate Research Fellowship Program. I'm using the mic not because I cannot scream, it's just because it's been um, shown online. So we have to use the microphone, guys, by the way, just so people uh, see it. And I don't know if anybody sees it. Uh, anyway, so um, it's kind of co-organized. Brian O'Meara from the EEB department also helped uh, uh, to put some things together. And so the panel today includes three graduate students at the uh, University of Tennessee. So um, um, Jordan Bush from uh, EEB department, and then uh, Sarah Cooper from a GST program, and then Todd uh, Pearson, uh, also from EEB. And we also have um, 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 our faculty, a person who has trained graduate students who have applied for fellowships as well as received those fellowships. So he will give us a little bit of his perspective on maybe on process, et cetera, at least um, kind of some, some thoughts, et cetera. Right? And you can maybe ask questions if you're interested. Right. Um, and so. Um, the way we're going to do that is that I'll give a little bit of uh, kind of very basic introductions into the uh, into the process, but probably like f five have five slides I think or six right, and then all the uh, graduate students will give their perspective and their personal kind of view on what they think is important in um, in in writing that application, and the way we're going to do it is that I do a presentation. If you have some questions, you can ask me. Probably don't ask me too many questions, but you can ask them because they are they are the uh, recipients of that award, so they have much more personal experience with how to do that, right? And then uh, and we'll write up, uh, wrap it up in some ways, and then have pizza, etc., uh, other things. Uh, okay, go ahead and get started. So it is about NSF, uh, uh, this particular fellowship, right? So uh, I'll just start, just if you ever even have not looked, I'll just give you very, very basic information which you're supposed to provide with that application. So um, um, it's kind of two-part application. One is a personal uh, um, a kind of statement, future goals uh, statement, which is um, essentially kind of your personal view on kind of who you are, how you came where you are, and where you want to go kind of with your, and how NSF fellowship will help you to go where you want to go, right? And it's uh, limited to three pages according to the rules, right? Uh, then the second part is uh, your research application. So it's not, it, it's not a research grant, so you only get two pages for that. Um, but it's still uh, an important component, right? So you have to really think about what, what you want to do with the money that NSF gives you, you know, what kind of research you want to do, what, what your research question, what are the hypotheses, and perhaps even outline experiments to a degree that two pages allow you to do. But the more uh, information you can put in that, uh, probably, not crowded again, so have a balance, the more confident reviewers will be about you being clear on what you want to do, right? <clears throat> You have to arrange for reference, uh, reference letters. Uh, generally, um, there's, you can get as many as five. And this would be your, if you're an undergraduate student, it would be maybe your um, advisor. If you do research with, with, a, uh, with a faculty member, maybe some of your um, class teachers. If you're a graduate student, it would be probably somebody from undergraduate school, maybe from graduate school, maybe some other professor you met or somebody, other researcher you've met. Uh, um, and uh, it's generally um, recommended to utilize all the uh, five slots. Okay. okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and so, I that. I, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Didn't introduce Terry Hazen. Uh, I'll do that before we turn over. And then you have to include your transcript. So definitely, you have to have reasonably good grades to kind of be maybe competitive. I mean, uh, but I don't know how important that truly is, but you definitely don't have Fs or something. Um, that, that probably doesn't help. 
uh, in the application. Okay, so if you want to read some more, uh, that's the solicitation number that if you look at NSF website, you just type in 16.5A8 and you'll find it. And it has all the detailed information about, you know, a little bit of details, what font size you should use, what page size means, what the margins are. And that, please follow those, you know, if you want to, because you, your application may not be considered if you don't follow a particular guidelines. So you make a very tiny font to include a lot of details on your uh, application and then it's below what is uh, needed, right? Uh, we have some time. So for this application, it's October 22nd, I think 2018 application. So you have more than a month. So I think if you start now, if you're planning to apply, and many of you replied saying that they are interested in applying, you have time, right? Uh, and we're going to have comments from, uh, uh, from our, our RDs, you know, is it good enough time for them to do that, or it's too late to do it next year? Because there are restrictions. Oh, it's next slide. Because there are restrictions on how many times you can apply, actually. As a graduate student, you can only apply once. So, um, so definitely, if you feel like it's not good enough, maybe don't submit it this year. Submit it next year. That's OK. Um, so just some information. So they generally give about 2,000 of those. I don't know what the success rate is. I, I tried to kind of find, but maybe I wasn't good enough. Mm, 10%? OK, good. So 10%. So that's not bad. It's not good. <laughs> so, but it's regular for a grant submission. It's like NIH grant submission success rate is about 10%. Uh, you get quite a lot of money, $138,000. Um, Right, and that's three years of support. So essentially, you get paid for your uh, tuition, uh, for your um, 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 uh, stipend, and you get waiver of tuition. I think, right? Plus, you have extra money to do uh, maybe a little bit of um, uh, supplies, cost of education. So, um, if you're not permanent citizen or permanent resident, I'm sorry, or citizens, and then you're not actually eligible, so which is unfortunate. So you can leave now. Any of you are present? Um, so the good thing is that as an undergraduate student, you can apply. And again, we are doing that. We're not including only graduate students in this, but also undergraduate students. And the benefit for you, if you apply and get it, you can go to any place. You can take that with you, whatever university you're going to go to. And if you have your own funding, effectively, you can go probably to any, any place. Because you essentially will be kind of free, or well, at least for three years, to the to that particular program. So if you feel like you, you, you have the time and you feel like you might be competitive in terms of you have good ideas, please apply. And even if you don't come to University of Tennessee, uh, it's absolutely fine, right? So uh, for your graduate studies. So in the graduate students, only once you can apply, but you can apply now first and second year. So it used to be just the first year and it's created lots of problems for, for people. So if you're a first year, Consider it, but you don't have to apply right away. So if you feel like maybe you want to get maybe that paper out or maybe think about or more about your proposal and your experiments, well, maybe do it second time, second year, because you have that opportunity. Um, I think Sarah will tell a little bit more about the submission, but essentially you submit it directly. So effectively, university has nothing to do with your submission. So you prepare it yourself and you submit, so you have to read about how to submit it properly. Uh, and that's, there's a website called Fastline, and that's where you do it. Uh, however, we discussed that a little bit with the graduate school. They would like to know if you've submitted an application just so they have heads up. Maybe you're gonna get it, so they are prepared. So please, if you are going to submit this year, whether you're undergraduate student or graduate student, doesn't matter. I think it's a good, if you could send an email just saying that my, my name is such and such and I applied for the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program, right, to grad school dean at utk.edu. Uh, and so I think it would be good for them as well just to have statistics, how many people are actually submitting stuff because directly they don't have that information. They'll have to go to the NSF to ask. And that would be a good way to know. You know, do we have 10 students a year applying, 100 students? What, what's the number? I think it would be good. So if you could do that, if you apply, please uh, try that. And uh, I again, mention that, that the feedback. So I, want, uh, I would like 
for you if, if, if you're here and presumably you have a computer or a cell phone to try to, run, to, to go to that uh, URL, which is simple, tinyurl.com slash utkgrfp. And it uh, has a very similar survey that I had before, but it has a couple of extra entries. Uh, and now it's just to, to emphasize how many people we actually have. So I think we're pretty close to what was expected. Uh, but also, you can put your email address there. So, sorry, so then it becomes a little bit less anonymous. Uh, but I will use that email to send you info, uh, the presentations that you see today. Right, so if you're interested in receiving this presentation as well as presentation of our, our uh, you know, students uh, with their tips and advice, so please do that. Uh, please include your email and I'll send uh, to whatever emails I receive, I'll, I'll send those presentations. Uh, so that would be probably kind of useful. Questions? I didn't expect many questions to me because I have never applied to that fellowship. Um, but not yet? No? Maybe? So I'll introduce Terry. I'm sorry, that's not good because I introduced all the students and didn't introduce the faculty. So this is Terry Hazen. Um, Terry is a governor's chair. It's a um, a joint position between Oak Ridge National Lab and University of Tennessee. And so he um, holds appointments in three different departments. So, he's, so he knows about a lot of things, so, which is uh, civil and environmental engineering, microbiology, and earth and planetary sciences. So if you are in those areas, you can definitely ask him for advice because his students have applied and won those applications, so those fellowships. So. So he might be your source if you're in those departments, ask him for advice or something. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move to Sarah. Hopefully you'll have questions then, because please ask. Oops. Okay, so I've put together uh, a few slides just with some tips um, about how I actually approached this application and was successful. And so my first piece of advice is start early. So you saw the uh, dates uh, in the end of October, so you still have some time. Uh, I applied both my first and second year uh, because when I first uh, started graduate school, the rules were a little bit different. Uh, uh, like Dr. Garnusov said, you can also apply as a senior and undergrad. And my first suggestion is just pick a topic or a general area and just start reading. That's how you're going to get ideas. Uh, even if those ideas are completely different than your final project, uh, at least you sort of got the wheels turning. Also, engage your advisor. Or if you're an undergrad, engage someone that uh, sort of is a mentor to you. Um, if you start a graduate school and you've joined a lab, then your advisor is not going to complain about having a free student. Uh, but if you're rotating, uh, you can also seek out mentors that way because that might make you seem like a more optimal rotation student as well. Um, and that's where I wrote my first application. Uh, also, think about what focus areas you want to apply to. So through the GRFP website, uh, they have all this information about the different focus areas. Um, and they look for interdisciplinary and collaborative projects. And so that was one of my focuses in my application. Um, I do mostly computational biophysics, but we were partnering with some people that do neutron science, and so it sort of um, bridged the gap between those disciplines. And another thing is, is um, if you're doing um, something that can fit into multiple categories, does one have a higher success rate? So my program is genome science and technology, and it's mostly a life science program, but I'm also doing chemistry, and I noticed that the chemistry success rate was slightly higher, so that's actually where I uh, tailored and submitted my application. Uh, so that might be something to consider. Um, another thing is don't neglect your personal statement. Uh, it's easy to want to focus on the research statement, but with help from advisors and your peers, anyone can come up with a relatively decent uh, research proposal, but you need to be able to stand out uh, through your personal statement. Uh, and so with mine, for example, uh, I started off with something that grabbed the reader's attention. Uh, my first sentence was, a candle, an almond, and a cheese stick are the three things I think about when I think about how I got interested in science. 
And so from there, I was able to tell a story and get people interested, even if they only read uh, the first line of my statement. Uh, and also, don't be afraid to utilize white space. So I've seen some example applications that was just a huge block of text. And um, I, I came to the realization after my first application where mine was more along those lines that taking out maybe a less important sentence and putting in a few returns or doing some bolding or underlining, just simple formatting uh, to get the important parts uh, can really make your application stand out. Uh, especially if someone's reading it and they're just skimming through it. Um, the people that review these get a huge stack of applications and they're not paying uh, maybe as much attention as you would like them to. And I know fitting all your ideas into such a small space is really hard, but that's sort of the point. They want to know if you can condense your thoughts down into something cohesive. And another thing that I learned both through this application and uh, through some other stuff in my graduate program is to come up with a concept figure. Uh, many people, they use visual learning to best understand things. So if you have some sort of conceptualization of your ideas, this can really tie your whole statement together uh, and um, make the reader uh, actually understand what you're proposing to do. And also edit. So your first draft is going to look nothing like your final draft, um, especially with such little space. There's a lot of last minute formatting and making sure everything fits um, and you've said everything that you need to say. Um, and you need to avoid jargon as much as possible. So these people are probably not going to be experts in your topic. And so if you can keep it um, towards more of a general audience that has a scientific uh, background, uh, that's probably better. And also uh, follow the rules uh, that Dr. Garnisoff mentioned are in the solicitation. Uh, if you don't follow the rules, they're not going to look at your application, uh, especially with respect to font sizes and margins. <coughs> Uh, in reference format. Um, it's sort of an easy way for them to weed out applications uh, from the get-go. And another thing that I learned after my, my first application um, where I wasn't, I wasn't successful in receiving the award is to be creative with my broader impacts. So the first time around I said things like, oh, I'll mentor some undergrads and do some local outreach. But all of the comments, so you get um, short comments back from your reviewers. And all of them said that my broader impacts weren't specific enough, and they weren't convinced uh, that it was going to actually um, provide the impact that they were looking for. So I suggest do, uh, finding specific things. Um, for instance, I talked to people at specific high schools uh, who might be interested in some sort of outreach uh, with my lab, and just listed those as examples. Um, and also, be reasonable. Don't claim to fix everything. Because on top of doing all this outreach, you have to do this research proposal as well and a bunch of other stuff, classes and whatnot. So don't, don't try to fix all the problems. And lastly, just tie everything together. So you need your um, personal statement and your research statement to sort of behave in a cohesive manner. Um, so it's OK to repeat things in both if they're important, such as if you mention your broader impacts in your personal statement, and then there's somewhere it can relate to your research and your research statement, maybe just mention briefly um, how it's all going to sort of fit together. And another thing I did the second time around is I sort of used my reference writers to my advantage. Because you only have three pages to write about your personal statement. And so I, I want to talk about all these broader impacts I did in undergrad and grad school. But then I emailed them and was like, can you just throw in maybe, oh, you did this um, and or these uh, outreach opportunities. And then they're speaking up for me and they're providing evidence uh, and sort of a track record for outreach that I had been doing uh, all along. And it was a lot less that I had to say myself. Um, and another thing is assume you're the last person in a stack of 50 applications. How are you going to stand out? How are you going to be memorable? Um, they're recommending and investing in you as a scientist. And so don't be afraid to mention your accomplishments uh, without seeming uh, too braggy. But they want to know that they're investing in someone that's going to be worth the $138,000 uh, that, that they're providing for you. And then I was asked to just put a little bit of information about the submission process. So um, like it was already said, you submit through this Fastlane um, portal. Um, here you submit, um, you, you uh, say who you want your reference li letters uh, writers to be, and it sends them an email and they handle everything on their end. Um, and then here's where you put all of your information about publications you may have or poster uh, presentations you've done, 
or uh, all your academic history um, and transcripts. Um, and as you already know, the deadlines are somewhere in the end of October, depending on your field. And uh, one thing I noticed with my project is if it's interdisciplinary, you have to apply it to the due date on your, as, uh, as your primary field. So if, even if your secondary field is later, you can't use that uh, to your advantage. And it allows you to pick the percentage of interdisciplinarity uh, of your application. And I recommend uploading the uh, PDF versions of your statements ahead of time because everyone's going to be trying to do this on the submission date. And if something fails with the upload process and you submit at 501, then they're not even going to look at your application. So I would do that. I did it the day before just so that it was done and out of, out of my hands. Any questions? Uh, so the first time I started probably around now and submitted in October, but the second time I had the full year and to learn from those experiences, so I did uh, my application uh, the second time around uh, was much more, uh, I'd say, put together. Uh, so I didn't have any preliminary data uh, for the project I was proposing. So since I do computational stuff, we sort of have the freedom. Uh, to, to work on a lot of different projects. But if you apply in, say, your second year of graduate school, you're probably expected to have more preliminary data. That seems to be a, um, a standard uh, perception. Whereas if you apply your first year and you're just, say, rotating, you probably don't have much preliminary data um, because you just got there. Or if you're an undergrad and you want to do a totally different project. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so, um, I'm gonna focus for the beginning mostly on the personal statement because I thought this was the hardest part. I thought going in that I kind of knew what a research statement was supposed to look like. You know, it has an intro, it has methods, it has you know expected results, all that kind of stuff. But I had no idea how to start my personal statement or what that would look like. Um, and so when I talk about this, I'm going to talk about my experience. And one thing, if you read personal statements that have, that have been successful, is you see that they're all completely different. Like everything about them is different. How they structured it is different, what they focused on, what their tone was, they're, they're very different. Um, and so my biggest advice for you is just to find what works for you and what you think reflects who you are and what you want to be as a scientist. So for example, mine was very, um, was very um, what's the word I'm going for? Very not relaxed, not casual, but it was like I told a story. So I actually told a story of a Thanksgiving um, encounter where I was talking to some people at my, my family dinner party and they like looked at me like I was crazy and I was telling them about my science. Um, and so that's what I started with and it was very personal and kind of went from there. Um, but other people keep it very, um, very formal and very scientific and that works for them. So just kind of find what works for you. Um, and so there's two, cri and, um, there's two criteria for the personal statement. Um, so there's the intellectual merits and there's the broader impacts. Intellectual merits is basically why you are a stud muffin, why you are a good scientist, why you're going to be a good scientist, why you're going to be successful with this money, right? And broader impacts is how you're going to make a difference as a scientist. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that here in a minute. Um, and so how I structured this is I kind of focused on, or I, I broke it up into three parts. I, the first part was just kind of me, who I was, my story. Um, the second part was what I had done. Most of this was focused on my undergraduate research. Um, and the last part was about what I wanted to do. Um, and so one thing we actually don't talk about on these panels is there's actually three aspects of your application. There's your personal statement, there's your research statement, but then there's also like an, um, an electronic application where you go through and that's where you give them your GPA and your GRE scores and your publications and all that kind of stuff. Yes? There's no, no GRE, sorry, not GRE, but your GPA, your, um, your uh, yeah, everything else, um, CV, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so so they, have, they have all this information. They have your CV, basically. So they know um, on paper what you've done. So, this is, so the personal statement is a good time to focus on what you specifically are proud of and what you think builds on your story. You know, so what research that you've done, why that was important to you, why that makes you, um, why you think that's going to help you be a better scientist. Um, 
things that you think you're going to, if you're going to build on them in, in graduate school or going to build them on your second year, that kind of stuff. So kind of um, things that, that really contribute to your story. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and so there's two different ways to approach broader impacts, and they're both legitimate, but I think they should be used very differently. So the first is how your research changes society. Um, and when I first wrote my, my first year FP application in uh, undergrad, this is what I thought of as broader impacts. I thought that I had to come up with some way that my research was going to change the world. Um, and I study lizard social behavior, so it, it's not going to change the world, frankly. Like, it's, it's, it's not going to, like, help. There's no health benefits. There's nothing like that. And so trying to write that in, it just it feels it feels like bullshit, frankly. Like people, people can see right through that. So if you have something that clearly has good impacts here, emphasize them and talk about them. But if you don't, don't emphasize them and don't talk about them because they will see through that. And that's and they you don't want to you don't want to act like you're 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 tooting your own horn when you shouldn't be, you know. Um, and so what I personally focused on was how I, as a scientist, was going to change society. And there's a ooh. Yeah, so, and there's a ton of things you can talk about here. You can talk about diversity issues, you can talk about science communication and how you want to talk to, um, how you want to um, interact with, with non-scientists. You can talk about mentorship, um, you can talk about breaking down science stereotypes, um, community involvement, outreach. There's a ton of things that you can talk about it here um, that even if you haven't done them before, you can do them. They're, there's stuff that a lot of people do care about. Um, and that these are, I think these are, these are kind of the lower hanging fruit with, for broader impacts. Um, but one thing, like Sarah was saying, if you do talk about these things, it needs to be specific. That's actually something that's a, a major theme in all GRP stuff, is you want to be as specific as possible. You don't want to say you're going to go out into this, the world, you're going to go to schools. You need to say, I have gone to schools, these are schools I'm going to, these are what I'm going to do, this is why I'm going to do it. Um, because that, that makes it sound like you're not just saying this because that's what you want them to hear, you're, making, you're saying it because it's something you actually care about. Does that make sense? Um, and so there's a lot of... Um, so there's different ways to approach that broader impacts. Um, so just kind of miscellaneous advice. Um, one thing that, that um, I think is a good thing to focus on in the personal statement is why you are going to be in a good place wherever you're going to be successful. So like, for example, when I, was, when I came to UT, um, I had a whole paragraph about why my advisor was really good for where I was going to, why I had good support here. I mentioned Nimbus. Um, I mentioned some of the, uh, the field stations that we had here. Um, so why you are going to be successful in your place and then why the GRFP will, will help you with that. Um, so for example, if funding is going to be a problem for you, that would be something to, to bring up there. Um, last thing, so research, this is, this is kind of my, my short advice for the research pro proposal. Um, like Sarah said, um, I think that re using bolding or font or something like that to highlight your, the major goals of your study is an important thing. Um, again, because so, if people are going to skim through it, you, wanna, like, you want at least the take-home messages to be, to be really clear and easy to see. Um, again, like Sarah said, using um, figures to explain either complex methods or your experiment. Um, and these are going to be good if you, can, if you can explain something in a figure in less space than you would explain it in words. That is a good way to like, that, that, that one, makes your proposal much more memorable, and two, that makes it, um, that, that, can, that can help you save some space in certain places. Um, and then finally, I don't know if there is now a citation format. There wasn't when I applied. There's not. Okay. I recommend the science and nature format because you can get a whole bunch of citations in there in very little space. And that is just the last name, the, uh, the last name of the first author, the, first, the initials of the first author, the year, the abbreviation of the, um, of the journal, and the issue, um, the issue numbers. And that, I, I fit like 20 references in like this much space. So that's my recommendation there. Um, I think that's all I got. One thing, um, just to comment on, on Sarah's um, talk about interdis interdisciplinary things. Um, with the GRFP, I think the, I've heard different advice for this. Um, one thing, the NSF just likes interdisciplinary stuff. Um, they like collaborations and those kind of things. So that's, that's, that's stuff that is going to, to make you stand out. Um, but I have heard specifically to be careful about applying as an interdisciplinary, um, like on the application saying that you're interdisciplinary in terms of like choosing the different uh, more than one um, subject, um, because then when they when they break up your review, what they're going to do then if you say you're thirty percent one and tw and um, sixty percent the other is they're going to give one reviewer is going to be that one and then the other two are the other two, um, and so that can get that means that you don't just have to convince a biologist that your work is good, you have to convince a biologist and a chemist or something like that, and having a chemist or a biologist that both understand the chemical implications and the biological implications of your stuff can be, can be harder. And there have been years where interdisciplinary stuff has gotten some of the lowest um, success rates. So 
just something to think about. Um, yep, that's what I got. Any questions? Yes. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Sorry. Yes. Um, so, when did you apply for the NSF grant? So, I applied once as an undergrad and I did not get it. And then I applied once my first year of graduate school and I did get it. Okay. That would still be allowed. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, have your uh, undergraduate performance bars outstanding? Uh, my question is suppose there is a student. Uh, who has a troubled history, who did not well in Sensa during his BS, and uh, now he now he want to do a PhD, and, and he he, is, uh, uh, he has changed basically. So so how uh, does he prove that this thing? Is it is it any way to do this? Um. Because if you are good from the beginning, there's no problem because you will write all these things. Uh, uh, research statement, personal statement, uh, extracurricular activities, and all these things. Um, so I've heard different advice for this. On the one hand, you're going to just get reviewers that are going to say you had a bad, you had a bad G um, GPA, and therefore you don't deserve it. And that's just where some people are at. And that sucks, but that's where some people are at. But at the same time, you're also going to have reviewers that, that are going to see what you're doing now and, and your, your current state, and are going to take that. Um, and so I think that. If you can talk about your experiences without necessarily drawing attention to the negative aspects, I, aspects, I think that that could be helpful. You know, where you, you you talk about kind of how you've grown and why this is important to you now, and what what your, um, why you think that your experiences really really are going to make you a better mentor or a better a better scientist, um, without necessarily focusing on the negative aspects of that. That would be my advice. I don't. Know, do you guys have any advice? Yeah. But the how I use the broader impacts for my reference writers, you could do that, I suppose, uh, in this scenario. You could maybe have a reference writer that's either seen you through the change or has been there uh, for a part of it, either on either end, um, who can sort of vouch for you uh, and maybe compliment uh, the non-negative things you might say um, maybe in your personal statement. So um, on the website for the personal statement, it has a few questions that you should kind of think about as you're writing. And a few of the questions specifically ask you to list out like what were the main questions and methods and findings of the research that you did in different experiences. Um, I guess this question is for all three of you. How closely did you follow that format? I think the more you can make it into a linear story about how, I mean, without making it cheesy, how you know, you've been on this path to be a great scientist your whole career, and how these experiences have built and brought you to where you are today, I think that's useful. So to the degree that you can talk about your past experiences and what you gained from them in a way that builds up to who you are now and what you're trying to do in the future, I think that's valuable. I think in my statement, I actually like had paragraphs where it was like, "This is the topic," or like, "This is the topic of this of this research paragraph, this is, or this research pro program. This is what I my methods, and these were the results." And so I actually had that in there. Um, I think if I were to do it again, I would I would have had it be more of a story because I think that that kind of broke it up a little bit, that made it a little bit harder to read. But um, I did that, and it worked. So. Also, I think it depends on where you're at. Um, I, I worked in two different labs in undergrad and at the time my first application had done or was on my third rotation so trying to fit you know all of those experiences in was hard but maybe you can also focus on maybe your main one and really really uh, hit that point um, and then sort of briefly mention any other experiences you might have at, as, an, as uh, sort of a more uh, compact but still tell a story um, just a slightly different narrative. I think your advice earlier was good. You can um, expand upon some of those in reference letters or ask your reference writer to expand upon them. Um, I think that's, that's a good way to do it.
Okay. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Todd. Uh, my advice is brief, and some of it might be repetitive from what you've already heard, but I do have salamander pictures next to it, so I hope it makes up for it. Um, so one of my main pieces of advice for, especially for the personal statement, is to avoid cliches. This isn't specific to the GRFP, but it's true for most applications, right? I think you had heard two good examples of hooks that brought the reader into your personal statement, but you don't want to quote the Merriam-Webster definition of research or science or something like that, right? Or start with some like, I don't know, cheesy quote that, that everybody might add on to there. Um, like assume that your uh, application readers have read 50 other applications, and if you use a very cheesy quote, they might have already read that quote three times, and it's not, it doesn't put you off to a good start. So I think you wanna make it really personal and tell a story of your personal growth and your personal career path Etc. But you want to do that in a way that's genuine and um, not cheesy or cliche. Uh, so this next bit of advice is for both the personal statement and the research statement, but more so the latter. Uh, it's to be clear and concise. And so one aspect of this is I think it's really helpful to have clear cut and delineated hypotheses. Um, even if your research is maybe not often hypothesis driven, I think it makes sense to structure it in a way for this application that is hypothesis driven. And if you can bold and italicize your hypotheses and maybe the data you'll collect to answer them explicitly, I think that's really helpful. Um, so as like a personal example, the propose, and this is a broader point too, I guess, um, you don't have to propose research that you're ever actually going to do. They don't hold you to it. You're proving that you can write a good research proposal. If it's something off the wall that's not related to your past experience, what you say you want to do, that, that won't look well. Um, but so I, I pitched a research project that I ended up doing but didn't make up any of my dissertation. And it was a little bit, um, or it wasn't quite the same as the research I was hoping to do in my PhD program here. But it was something that had much more explicit hypotheses. And I had some preliminary data from another part of that experiment that I could include as a figure. So I think. Um, yeah, focusing on something that you can have clear hypotheses for, and if you have some preliminary data that can fit into a figure or something, that was very helpful too. Oh, that's the advice I just gave. Um, so I, you heard an example of using a figure to make like concept map or description of your methods, but I think if you, another great way to do it is if you have preliminary data. Um, I think one thing to keep an eye out for is that I think they only accept black and white figures. Does that sound right? Do y'all remember? You submitted a color one? There was some warning when I submitted about maybe they'll only get it in black and white. So maybe double check that before you submit a figure. But also assume that they print it in the black and white print. That's right. So even that if might it's be true. Color figure, you don't know what's print. So make sure that it, it looks fine. And um, right, your figure should effectively communicate information better than you could in text. But also, it, it just is a nice visual break. Um, from the written text, kind of like the white space that Sarah was talking about. Um, this is a point that Jordan emphasized well, but I just want to say it again, because I have friends who have applied for this and have been knocked heavily for the way that they wrote their broader impact statement. It's a very small piece of the proposal, but it can have a high impact on your success. Um, so even if your research directly pitches to solve climate change or something really impactful for society, that's not what they want to hear about necessarily. That should be woven into your research statement, personal statement, et cetera. But this broader impact should have very concrete things that you aim to do, perhaps to um, reach out to underserved or underrepresented groups in science, for example. So even if your research itself has a really high societal impact, that's not necessarily what you want to write about here in your broader impact. Um, and I agree with the advice you guys heard earlier that it, something, the more specific and concrete it can be, the better. If you talk in generalities, um, it, it probably won't reflect well upon you. Um, okay, that was, that was my brief advice. I had one other thing I realized that we haven't exactly said, just to clarify about the letter writing, unless anything has changed. You can submit three letters of recommendation. Um, you can upload to the NSF website more than that, I think five but only the top three you rank get read by your reviewers. That's important because if you don't have three, you're automatically disqualified. Um, and if your letter writers are like mine, they don't necessarily get you the letters in a prompt fashion. So it's good to ask for more letters than you use. I think I asked for four. And you never have to tell that fourth letter writer whose letter you never used that you didn't use it. You rank them, um, and the letter writers don't necessarily find out if you use their letter or not. 
Another piece of advice that I received, and this is maybe meaningful if you're a first year student, um, even if you don't know your advisor in your PhD or master's program very well, um, I have heard that at least in some reviewers' eyes, it looks, poor, it looks bad to not have your advisor write you one of the letters of recommendation. So they might not know you that well, you've only known them for a couple of months, you might not have done any research in their lab yet, but perhaps they can speak to you know, what they saw in you when they admitted you to the university or what research you plan to do and how you're setting yourself up for that. So there might be some dissenting opinions about this, but that's, that's advice I got and I followed. So there's a question from Twitter. So is it acceptable to provide reference letters from non-science professors, non-scientists? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, is it acceptable to provide reference letters from non-science professors and non-scientists? Yes, it is. Is it wise? It depends on uh, how strong the letter is. especially because the reviewers might not be directly in your field and that name might not mean anything to them anyway. So, uh, so how do you basically define the concise uh, uh, statement of purpose because right now you know I'm about to finish my master's and I'm applying for PhD so I I wrote uh, uh, I think uh, uh, 10 pages of a statement of purpose and then they told me that it is too big and then I uh, you know sorted out and two pages then it was too short and somebody told me that you have to exaggerate because you have to sell so if you don't exaggerate your credentials then they will not admit so, so how to optimize, you know, all these parameters in order to, uh, uh, you know, do beautifully these things? So, so as they said, it needs to be continuous flow. You need, it needs to be a continuous path from when you started and you had this epiphany to become a scientist or, or whatever. And you can write some personal statement about that going all the way through to your, your research plan. And by the way, let me emphasize, it's emphasized in the instructions, this is not a proposal, it is an application, okay? So you have a research plan, it is not a proposal, okay? They are not going to hold you to that in any way, shape, or form, as, as, as was said, okay? But it needs to be... You need to make sure it flows continuously, okay? And okay. some other advice I received that I've followed, I don't know how true it is, is that it's very tempting to write your personal statement and end it basically at the current point you're at. You know, this is how you got to your graduate program. And then you start your research plan, not proposal. Um, but, and I think there's a prompt in the NSF prompt to tell you to talk about your future career plans too. So you wanna convince them not only that, you know, you've been on this great path up until now, but that you're in the exact right place you wanna to be to continue your plan and that talk a little bit about what you wanna do in the future and how the GRFP would launch you into that. So do you guys know if it's more competitive as a graduate student to apply your second year versus your first year? So I guess like what are the benefits of applying your first year um, and what are the benefits of applying the second year? I think the expectations second year uh, are certainly higher, uh, especially probably with regards to some sort of preliminary data or uh, how it ties in. Um, but I don't know if there's any specific metrics as to, to which one is better. Um, it sort of depends on where you're at. If you have a solid advisor that you know you want to work with and maybe your first year might be a better shot for you. Um, but if you don't know and you haven't joined a lab yet and you want to wait that extra year to work on your application, also you've, you've had an extra year to work on it and you've 
presumably been working on some sort of research throughout that year and gained experience. So I think in terms of the uh, research plan, um, the quality of that proposal uh, might be also a little higher in the second year. Hello. Okay. Okay. I've heard really conflicting advice. Um, so at, at a conference, um, actually right before I applied, I met, um, I think she was the head of the GRP at the time, so somebody important. Um, and she specifically said at the time you could apply both first and second year. Um, and she said that, that most people got it their first year and that actually second year was the lowest number of people that got it because that was where they had the highest expectations. That was where you were expected to have preliminary results. You were expected to have done something in graduate school and out of other people, but I didn't necessarily do a lot my first year because I was still figuring out my life. So. Um, so that's something to consider, but I think, I think it just kind of depends on how strong you think you can get your, your statements. Because at the end of the day, like, first year, you, 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 you can only do so much in a year, you know? So like, at what point do you just figure out, get a good um, proposal and a good, and, and just make sure it's written well, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Just if you can make it written well and make it strong, I think that it doesn't really matter when you, when you submit. Um, and so if you feel like you're not in a situation to do that for whatever reason, because you are, you know, you're new or you don't know what you're doing, you don't have an advisor yet, that's completely legitimate and do it the next year. But if you feel like you, you could get, a, get it situated, and I would try it, like, you know, write one. And if you really like it, submit it. And if you really don't, don't submit it, you know, and that's, and that's okay. So I, I would recommend at least, at least writing one this year. I think that's good advice. And I think part of the reason we have a wishy-washy answer is that yeah. this rule is pretty new, that when we applied, I don't know what year you applied, cruise in. But when we applied, there, were, there was no limit to the number of times you could apply, just the years in which you were eligible. eligible. Um, so this new like one and done thing when you're a graduate student is something we didn't apply under. Yeah. So maybe we don't know the right strategy yet. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and I was wondering, so I just joined a lab where the PI just started, and we're brand new, so we don't entirely have that much funding yet. And I was told by another student that most of the people who do get funded through this application are people who are working for really well-funded and established labs. I was wondering if that's actually true, and if so, okay. <laughs> that is not true. Okay. Does it make those like applications stronger, though? Like, should I do something to make mine stronger at that point, or does it really have no effect? They're going to look at what you've written, mm -hmm. and and that you have this um, goal to do something significant in science and academia, okay? okay. And, and that's the most important thing, is to have this flow through the entire, you got three pages of personal statement, two pages for your research plan, okay? Um, and of course, um, you know, grades and everything else, but. Thank you. But it's not true that, that uh, you have to have a, a well-known professor and uh, with lots of money. <laughs> okay, so I haven't heard much about like undergrads, but I'm an undergrad. I'm gonna be a, I'm a senior, and I'm gonna be a, a super senior. So I heard someone say that um, they applied their undergrad year. I think it was Sarah. Um, okay, sorry. Um, but what advice would you give to undergrads that are considering applying and with a recent epiphany in the sciences, I guess? We'll say that. Um, I would say definitely apply. Um, I think the reason that they changed it from being able to apply both years to only being able to apply one year in graduate school is because they wanted more undergraduates to, to get it. And so I would definitely apply. Um, I would check. I think that you have to, you have to be enrolling in graduate school the next year, right? Is that right? So if you're, if you're not graduating this year, you might wait until next year to apply. Um, but as an undergrad, I would, I would definitely apply. I think that, they're, that, they, that the NSF wants to, to give this to undergrads. It wants this to be something they do because it's, it's really good bargaining power in, um, in graduate school. Um, and so when I applied, um, I had a, a research lab that I was a part of um, that I, I sat down with the advisor and we kind of talked through stuff. And that one, clearly, I was making up a project out of the clear blue sky because I like, wasn't in a lab yet. Um, but I was actually talking to a lab, and so like that, I, I got the person that I was talking to was one of my letter writers, um, or no, it wasn't, but but helped. Um, sorry, that was that was not true. But he he read my application, and, and it w and it spoke to his lab, um, and so that was something that, that I did. Um, but I didn't get it in my undergrad year, so that's maybe not great advice. <laughs> 
I also think going through the process is a good thing. I mean, the first time I learned a lot um, of what not to do the second time. Um, and maybe some of the, you'll get, you'll get your few comments, and maybe some of them will be useful, and it will sort of point out some of, some of your gaps. Uh, and maybe you can fill those gaps uh, once, you, once you enter graduate school. So whenever you guys applied, did you have, or how many papers did you guys have published perhaps, or did you guys have any papers published? Zero? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just had one small one, but nothing, uh, nothing major. And that was one of the actual negative comments on my second application was that there's no proof that I had done anything uh, sort of in this field uh, to contribute. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know it, if it's necessarily a bad thing. It's just one of those things where if you have somebody with, you know, three publications versus zero, then they might look slightly better. But um, there's a lot of aspects to the application, and so stuff like that isn't necessarily a deciding factor. It also depends on your field. Some fields are expected to publish a lot quicker than others. Okay. Yeah, I was in a similar situation. Not much. But if maybe you have some other way to convince them you have taken a project to completion, if you can talk about somewhere you've presented your research, um, et cetera, I think that's a good way to prove the same point. 